Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to Jim Van Tygum. He is a true maintenance professional with experience going back to the late 80s in industrial manufacturing, plant operations, service management, and maintenance management. Jim is currently the senior support manager of CMMS at Gentech, and I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for joining us today, Jim. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, you and I have talked previously, you know, before we jumped in for this episode, and you've been inspirational to some of the different people that I've talked to and worked with as it relates to maintenance and reliability, talking about the real problems and actually coming up with real solutions that are actionable. You know, none of this, oh, let me tell you about my product or let me tell you about this and that, more about how does it really happen in the real world. So, I think for me, that's refreshing. And I think anybody that gets a chance to listen to this or watch this gets an opportunity to learn. But what I'd really like to understand is your passion for maintenance and reliability. How did that really happen and develop? So a little bit of your background, but you know how, how you got to this space where you're so damn passionate about it. Well, let's start the story with back in the late 80s, as you had alluded to. Uh, I started as a uh, industrial mechanic. My forte back is uh, back then, prior to the industrial world, was auto mechanics. In that day, we're class A auto mechanic, a truck and coach mechanic. So I ventured out of that field and got into industrial mechanics. And uh, it didn't take long to get into the um, the maintenance management field or maintenance management position, and literally. Standing on a floor, I can actually vividly see this right now, Greg. I was standing on a floor looking at all my production equipment, asking the question of myself, I want to see every mechanical problem related to a seized bearing on this equipment. And how am I going to do it? Because I am absolutely tired of it's broke and I fixed it. That means nothing. So my career really started at that particular point when my mindset changed. And that's very important as we're going to talk about that when we get into this a little bit deeper. But um, that journey took me down a road of, of uh, discovery, not just of CMMS systems and the, and the role that RCM plays. We're talking 35 years ago. So you can imagine how much RCM uh, practices and so on have evolved during this period of time. So, you know, I was pioneering my own way through things and uh, regarding, you know, uh, PM optimization, defect elimination, even though those terms are used today, those were things that we were working on back in those era, in that era. And uh, one of the most important things, Greg, that I ran across was not so much the pragmatic approach of maintenance, but the people involved, not just production, uh, I'm talking uh, all various departments, quality, whether we're talking midterm management, we're talking uh, upper management, exec management, we're talking people on the floor, the average Joe. A lot of it stemmed from understanding human nature and then trying to get into the realm of finding out why equipment is doing what it's doing or not doing what it's supposed to do. Because a good portion of what we do in our field is not related to a breakdown of equipment. It's a breakdown of communication and people. And so that said, my career just evolved and continued to evolve. I ended up being a uh, a lead uh, support, tech support for Guardian Industries, which is one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world. So I had the great privilege of being able to travel all over the world and experience the same problems in different countries, understanding that the problems are all the same. And when you go into one company, say Middle East, 
and you go to South America and you go into another company, you start to understand that there's a trend. There's a trend going on in our industry. It hasn't changed in 30 years, but you can almost be a mentalist by telling somebody exactly what's going on in their head and what they're experiencing. And then you get that deer in the headlight look as to, I thought we were the only people that had a problem. So that said, I spent a fair bit of time uh, developing training programs, trained you know hundreds of people globally. I spent a lot of time looking at uh, you know continuous improvement ways to try to get data. For me, one of the most important things in my career has been getting useful, meaningful, accurate data so that we can turn the needle uh, in the right direction for what we need to do. Without that. We're just not going to do anything new today that hasn't been done in the last 30 years, which is nothing really. Right. So the career has evolved. I held many different positions. I was very fortunate to be in, in a project management, operations management, uh, you know, the service management so-called side of it. And now where I am today is like started the career all over again in the support, taking care of uh, six plants at the moment and eventually possibly 10 helping to guide this whole uh, company and its maintenance or its asset care in a positive direction. We need to get the basics of maintenance down and that's what we're working on right today. Got to, got to start with the basics, right? Yeah. You and I had that conversation. <laughs> it's, and I, I put it on my list today of, you know, why that's, why that is such a critical factor when it comes to long-term success, whether, so when I say long-term success, you got to have a short game and a long game, and that's all relative to the long-term success. So why are those basics so critical and what are they really in your view? Well, first of all, I think uh, Eric uh, Hucha, I think he's, I think that's the pronunciation of his last name. He has a lot of great data that he, uh, that he shares on LinkedIn. And he talks about the basics of maintenance. So let's talk about that for a second. What's the basics? So you're in the world, you are in the world of CMMS systems. So you understand that we create work orders, we create preventive maintenance type tasks, schedules, and we have material management uh, issues that we need to address or we need to uh, develop. And we have time management. And out of that, it's just one big funnel when you dump all this data in to come up with management reports at the end. I cannot fix or come with resolve if I don't have data. And so the basics to start is, can you get your assets in the system? Am I collecting time? Am I collecting meaningful, useful repair history? You and I know both know this, that if you had to take, if you had to implement a system, the quickest and biggest bang for your buck is get your assets in first and then start creating work orders. Repair history is the biggest bang for the buck right off the bat. Preventive maintenance, material management could follow uh, after the fact. But if you're talking about why we're not getting the basics, it's because either people are afraid they're afraid to do the work or it's Peter's been paying Paul, but Peter's already robbed and he has no more time. He or she has given no more time now to put in a system to, to better manage their direction of their asset care. And that's a big one. People don't realize you're going to throw, you're going to sell me something and then you're going to throw a, another stack of uh, tasks on top of the 50,000 tasks I already have. I'm not going to do it. That's so where do we start right with this? That's why getting the basics of maintenance is important, but let's take it one step further. Why is it happening in the first place? I think you came up with some, some suggestions yourself last time we spoke. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I think, and I'm going to mix in not just my thoughts, but some of the thoughts we shared as it relates to that conversation. So, one of the central themes behind this and what I'm hearing right now, what we talked about before is operationally, a lot of these organizations, they're kind of pigeonholing themselves by not taking the time to 
I want to say do it right, but what I mean is there's going to be some disruption if you're going to go and do this right, even if you're just going to focus on those basics. The basics play because it's going to set your foundation for how you move forward. But organizationally, we would then bring in these concepts of, well, maybe they don't know where to start. Maybe they don't have someone that can coach them and guide them through it because these are such uncharted waters. And they also, they being, you know, anyone that's struggling with this is, why are we not thriving with our data collection and understanding more about our operations so that we can start to move better, faster, more efficient, yet still always deliver the high quality things we want to deliver as outcomes. And they can, they can really end up getting accustomed to what their situation is and refusing to take that disruptive downtime that's actually going to play out in a much more positive way over, let's say, a six to 18 month period as they become more mature from a maintenance maturity perspective. And I think what you're probably going to say, and I'm not trying to be a mentalist, but we've really got to talk about and turn this into a discussion about mindset and maintenance mindset because there's behavioral change involved when you've got techs that, you know, they don't want to do this because they don't understand why, but they do kind of understand the outcome, but really all they're saying is include me in what you're about to do before you actually do it. Don't do it the other way around. So I think that all plays around mindset that you are a very big proponent on and you have an absolute insider's view to what that mindset is and what it can be. Can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. It's a great big can of worms when you open up mindset. It really is. And think about it for a second. If you look at the industrial world today, uh, if we looked at the last 35 years, Greg, and even um, Bob Latino, who's a brilliant guy, is another person that would be great for the show. Bob had written a white paper about the status of maintenance and, and reliability engineer back, you know, some three decades ago. And basically, the observation is nothing's changed. So the question, though, begs, why doesn't it change? We have to lean in with that curiosity. Behavior is a symptom. It's not the problem. It's like a machine. A machine behaves in a certain way. We have to lean in with curiosity and find out what is causing this behavior. If you have a bad day and you're angry, I'm going to get in and find out why you're having a bad day and angry too, because your anger isn't the problem. It's a symptom of something. So when you look at maintenance and you look at production and quality in our industries and you wonder why maintenance is not moving forward and you start to ask and lean in and look at the behavior of why are maintenance guys standing around? Why is it so difficult for a maintenance guy to put something in a system that will give so much benefit back? and only require 30 seconds of data input with codifications that make sense, why are they not doing it? That's the question that really begs for me. And when I study this and I look at it, I'm going, wait a minute, this, this requires a lot of stepping back and finding about yourself first. One of the best courses I had ever taken, uh, which I'm still uh, partaking in, is by Rob Kalbarowski and, and Susan Hobson from High Elite Performance. We're talking about mindset and leadership and talking about what does that really mean? You have a lot of maintenance people standing or you have a lot of maintenance people that are, are begrudgingly doing tasks. It's important to find out now why is that happening? Is it because, as you said, are they not involved in part of the process? Are they finding problems and not being heard? Because I'll tell you, that's a big one for any department, anywhere in the industry, any corporate office, anywhere. People not feeling hurt, psychological safety, right? On the other side of that, we talk about technicians. Not all technicians are the same, right? Yeah. You know, some have better skill sets than others. A lot of times when we have our technicians go to these trade schools, they're not, they're not taught to work uh, under stress. They're not taught in, in a, such a fashion that, hey, when you get into the workplace, it isn't going to be sunshine and puppy dogs here. You know, it's not going to be like somebody's going to gift you and say, hey, this is the problem with the machine. Here's all the clean parts over here. Put them on. What they need to do is say, hey, look, 
the chain fell off this. There's probably a sprocket damage. You got 10 minutes to fix it. Get going. And let's see what you can do. That's the reality of the world. Mm-hmm. But we're not presented that reality. So if you look at maintenance people themselves, they are also indirectly affected by other departments and their lack of ability to, to take ownership for their portion of the pie that's being um, put forth you know, in profits and, and product to the customer. What I mean by that is, imagine you're a mechanic and you're constantly doing reactive maintenance. You're constantly doing that. Now, remember, we always talk about culture, okay? And I'm gonna throw the word culture, I hate culture. If you ask Jim Van Tine about culture, I say, stop co- talking to me about culture. I want you to talk to me about the system for which the culture wrapped itself around. I want the pig in the blanket because that's what it is. Cultures are built off of systems. And what a culture tells us when we walk into a plant, it's telling me, what is your system? What is your ability? What is your means of producing that end product? Whether you want to avoid willful, willful blindness and hey, I don't give a shit about the quality of the product. I just want to get it out the door. Um, I don't care if you have a bad day, Greg, and you're working on the line. I want the product out the door. Do you see where I'm going? I have a system in place. It's treating you like crap, really. And it's treating the product like crap. And it's basically treating my customer like crap. So now everyone builds this comfort zone around that product, that process. And now you have a culture. So when I'm trying to put in CMMS systems, which I am now, again, I have to work on the mindset of what happened prior to. If you want to talk about mindset in, in as far as maintenance concerning getting buy-in, because I've heard a lot of this uh, in, in many conversations about, well, how do we get the upper management to buy in? You know what the first question you have to ask yourself? What's that? Is what is their thought pattern to begin with? There's something I learned that's very important to understand. High achiever versus high performer. Two separate entities. I spent a lot of my time being a high achiever. And let me explain that a little bit more to you. And you're going to get maintenance guys be high achievers. A lot of CEOs, high achievers. A lot of mid-tier managers, high achievers. A high achiever are the people that burn out. They're the ones that will go above and beyond, possibly step on people to get things done. They'll, they'll allow the means justify the end, whether the end is correct or the means was correct or not, as long as I see that end product. So now you have a CEO that, that uh, for instance, grew up in an environment where they had problems with dad. Dad said, you're no good. You're no good. You're no good. You're never going to amount to anything. All of a sudden, I'll show you, dad. Next thing you know, this person is climbing the ladder to become the CEO. The behavior and the, the, the pattern of that behavior starts to show itself in the industry. And then all of a sudden, what happens? You don't get by him because that person doesn't want to hear you crap. You got to know your audience before you start. So in the CMMS world, we're expecting people to buy in to something when maybe they maybe don't want to buy in in the first place. Or you don't know how to talk to them. You don't know their language, their script, how they present themselves, the words that they say, the timber of the voice. That sounds, you know, it can sound pretty daunting when I say that, but I'm telling you, my friend, you want to see a difference, learn your audience. It's no different than, uh, I think Spencer, the gentleman named Spencer asked a question of you. Yeah. I thought it was a- Spencer Pope. Yeah. Great. You know what? Great question. So let's talk about that question for a minute. How do I get an upper management to support me and not think of me as a cost center, as a maintenance? My friend, everybody's a cost center. Think about it. Now we have to take the semantics of what we say and let's turn this cup around. Let's look at it from a different light. I work in maintenance. Do I make money? Likely not for the company? Do I help to reduce, am I helping to reduce the effect of lost profit? Absolutely. And so this is where the mindset of 
of where we have to turn around the idea of cost center and use it to our advantage, like pain and pleasure. Pain and pleasure run your life. You either use them or they use you. You decide. So if somebody's saying you're a cost center, you either take that information and turn it around and present it back in a way that that CEO or that that mid-manager, mid-level manager can understand. So think about it for a second, Greg. If we're a cost center, then everybody's a cost center. When you're in a reactive maintenance environment, then you as a cost center are are probably affecting the bottom line in a very, very negative way. Because now all these things that were forgotten or all these things that get put aside, uh, you know, all the repairs that should have been done that are not getting done, what are they doing to the bottom line? When you're, you know, you could have fixed the problem in an hour versus now it's six hours. That lost revenue now just took away from my profit. And my friend, it's all about profit. If you've got production people that are not, you know, make 50 bad parts, it's not double, it's triple the amount of time to redo those parts. What are you doing? You're a cost center and you've just cost me a lot of money in my profits. Mm-hmm. So the way to sell back to management is start looking at your CMMS system, start looking at the basics, start thinking out of the box and saying, if I were to take this data and I could improve by two or 3% or a percent every week, I can, whether you call it uptime or downtime, okay, this it's relevant, they're both the same. If I can improve my uptime for equipment and I could take that and I could show that model to my manager, now I need to sell something to my manager. I just don't go and say, hey, I need more people. Hey, we need a system to manage. And I go, why? What, do you, what am I going to get out of it? But if I go to this manager, I have to educate a manager that probably knows nothing about maintenance. Right. Don't go in guns a blazing when you don't even know your audience. They know nothing about maintenance. Educate them. I'm in a position right now where I have to, uh, where I'm about to write an email and work with all the plant managers that I deal with and teach them what it is they need to ask of their maintenance departments. Go and teach the managers that are unfamiliar with the maintenance maintenance or asset care of that department, teach them what to, to ask, teach them what to know, teach them the Reader's Digest condensed version of why you do what you do, and also teach them where the value is that you're gonna give them, where you need support, and what to expect and have them hold you accountable. This, you know, I mean, this is this, just, just a complete mindset change. And how many of people in this audience watching this has really thought about that? Going out and reaching out to their managers and, and educating them and holding themselves accountable for the uh, holding, uh, having the manager hold the maintenance department accountable for their actions. It's a great approach. It's a great approach because when someone's in that mid-level or above management role, they're, they're, they're moving things around. They're running only a certain aspect that's high impact when it comes to top line, bottom line revenue and all these types of things. But as we, as we look at these hierarchical structures and whatnot, uh, it's not always kumbaya and all this great stuff. It's sometimes really about focusing in on objectives And if we're going to take this maintenance mindset, understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we've decided, hey, we need a CMMS, then when you go to that individual, you got to give them not just the backstory, but you've got to allow them to discover the meaning as opposed to forcing the meaning on them is really what I'm hearing. And you're going to have different responses from different people in these various management roles. And for me, the reason I'm talking about it is, of course, I love what you said. For me, a lot of the time I was in that role where I was acting as the consultant for the organization. And then I've got an internal champion because on one hand, I want to position things well for them so that they can acquire the software that I'm representing at the time or the software that I might have identified is really the right fit for their specific problem because I think that's what what really, really happens. But internally, 
they're not necessarily going to be in a position to do it the way I've done it for them. So I want to try to introduce some guidance for them on how they're going to go to their manager or someone in procurement that, I mean, they, they look at the CMMS and they're like, well, this is, I don't know, 12,000, 22,000 a year. And that's all they see. And if you think you're going to get them to appreciate it in the way that you do as the maintenance manager, the person that's in charge of the CMMS and you're trying to replace the one you have or any of those kinds of things, you've, you've got to kind of build that up and it can't be, it has to be really intentional. And I want to go back to what you said earlier about leaning in on the curiosity. I think it's fair to say, Hey, for all of you out there that are championing, championing this idea of getting a new or your first CMMS platform, you, you really can lean in on that curiosity, just a touch and you'll see a, a big difference, you know, be a little bit more curious about why that manager doesn't see it. Don't get hung up on, you know, being pissed off and don't, I tell people, don't go full Greg on anybody. It's not going to get you anywhere. Man. You got no chance as soon as, as soon as you start. But it doesn't mean I don't get those things. And yeah, because I was, I talk to people about stuff like soft skills and all that. And I, I get it. But, you know, these managers, they're just really super busy and they don't necessarily have time to understand things the way you do. So for vendors, maintenance personnel, all the different players, and then working with management in the C-suite, they need you to make a presentation that explains why it's meaningful to you so that they can then themselves buy in. And they will, and certainly they might not, but don't ever give up. And if you don't make progress when you're trying to do this and you're not getting what you need from that manager, try to figure out why, but don't, don't lose your shit. Don't do anything like yeah, that. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it's it's great. So I I wanted to um, bring up another question, if you don't mind. And sure. so I'm just going to look at my notes real quick. So you mentioned that not not all maintenance technicians are equal. We've got different skill sets. Mm -hmm. I want to get to something a little bit deeper around implementations in CMMS because mm -hmm. I think kind of as a part two previously, we talked a little bit about why implementations fail. But what can you talk to me about when it comes to why implementations fail when it comes to a CMMS platform, what's your view on that? You know, when I started my career, uh, there was a great article written. I'm going to have to share that with you sometime. And it had like 30 points or 35 points on why CMMS implementations fail. And those still hold true today. You know, you know, if we just talk a lot of what we're going to say here will be, heard and probably felt the same through a lot of different uh, people in our audience. They'll feel that they have experienced these things. Unrealistic time frames, uh, you know, inability to uh, have the expertise to put the system in, uh, you know, not understanding the end in mind approach, just, uh, you know, I could go on and on with the list, but if we look at some of the, the real uh, issues why CMMS fail, um, some of them for me uh, really boil down to a couple. I have a need, but I don't know how to express my need. And when I say that, and, and you know as well as I do, there's a lot of CMMS systems out there. There are. Greg, do they Basically, the basics of maintenance, don't they all try to do the same thing? Don't they, you know what I mean? Like to, just, the, I mean, the software application, create a work order, put time against the work order, put material, put a, uh, put a piece of equipment, an asset against it, put repair marks against it. Let's just take it. So that's the basics. I've worked with quite a few of them. I just need to figure out which field. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second, preventive maintenance. I need to create preventive maintenance schedules. And so they give you a host of different schedules. Some give some better uh, functionality than others, but I'm trying to get that in place. Uh, inventories, implementation, you're putting inventories in. Again, a host of them give you all these fields. They give you all the locations. They get, so a lot of it's the same. Where it real, really, really boils down to is the inability for a lot of our software companies to really 
help get that turnkey for our people. Remember I told you originally, you got a big stack. When and I know that I'm running through different, I'm running from different scenarios here. I'm running all over the place. Okay. Well, let's bring it into, let's, let's start, let's start reeling all these things in. Number one, before you start, you got to have an end in mind. You got to know what you want. So you tell me what plant A over here would want different than plant B in information. Really, do they want different information? Do I not want to see mean time between failures? Do I want, do I not want to track my corrective maintenance and how well I did in my preventive maintenance? Do I not want to track my unscheduled versus scheduled? A lot of the reporting modules that we start off are the same. Mm -hmm. So even when you're doing your implementation, you have to sell a story too, to the people you're with. We talked about this, uh, remember my experience in India when I told mm -hmm. you? When I stood in front of people and I used this uh, presuppositions and a uh, little mindset technique, sitting with all these East Indians. And I said, what if you had, so what if, so imagine if, because imagine if is a great, I use, I learned this uh, through hypnosis with my friend when I did some entertaining, he was a master hypnotist and he started this school and uh, I was one of his guinea pigs. And then I work with him in an entertainment world. But one of the things we use is the imagination. It's the most powerful thing we have when we're setting up goals for the future. So if you imagine a, a system or a process, okay, not the culture yet, the process by which you could create this work order, you could track through keywords, this bearing failed. So seized bearing, two words, my bearing condition seized. I don't need to write a story, do I? Uh -huh. Seized bearing. Why did it fail? Lack of lubrication. Oh, what does that tell me? So now I've got what? Seize bearing lack of, I got five words. Now I finish it off and go, r and &R bearing, review a PM inspection. I am getting a host of information with little input, which is like 30 seconds of input. So when we're talking about why implementations fail, we make it too difficult for the end user because we think we, we're so ingrained in our minds as maintenance managers and techs and all this, all the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the industrial world of your mind and it's got to be analytical and problem solving. We just make ourselves go crazy by trying to put too much complexity to it. Make it simple. So when I'm putting this data in, that's when I find when we're talking about implementations, what I found, give it simple. A lot of times, this is just for me. I realized this back about 20 years ago. I don't care what software package it is. If you were to come in and you were just to set up, I want to segregate my CM corrective maintenance from my PMs, from my EMs or DM downtime, which is unscheduled. I had scheduled unscheduled. And then I had some projects and, you know, there may be projects or safety related. I take five or six codes. And then I build this library of failure player class. And I just say, I either got a people issue. I either got a machine issue. I've got a uh, material issue. Really? And then I, to each one of those, I create a problem uh, classification or a failure classification, a uh, cause classification and a repair classification. If I were to go to you and I was to install a software package for you and I had some of those fields already populated and I said, hey, look, I'm going to sell something to you, Greg. What if you had this ability? Once we get some of your assets in, we can take this one line and we can in one day we can have all your assets in. What if you had the ability to do this? Imagine, if you will, you create a work order because the machine is down. And you have the ability to pick that code from that list here, EM or DT or whatever you want to call it for downtime. Mm -hmm. Now I click the code, I put the asset in, and now I can go down here and I can put a problem, a cause and action, and then some other fields if I want to add a little extra information. And then later on, you have the ability at any time to look at this history by just going, show me all problems related to a, a failure by a machine that was related to a seized bearing. How beneficial would be that be to you? 
You know what you're going to do? You're going to shake your head. You're going to say, absolutely. Now, here's the tricky part. It's after you get somebody saying, absolutely. What is that gap between stimulus and response where they don't want to do the responses? Now, they don't, still don't want to do it because they told you that would be great for them. And this is the part of the implementation we don't talk about. If it was that simple, why are they not doing it? And then I look and I, and then you use that data back to them. You say, well, you did say this. You did say, I know. Uh, yeah, but it's still difficult. Is it? Let's try it. Because you, you know, let's try it. So you take that and you sit them down and you give them some hands on because talking is easy. Walking the talk and getting somebody to do it. And all of a sudden, before you know it, they go, oh, this isn't so bad. You give them, you got a dummy database. You give them 10, 15 work orders before you know it, they're going, you know what? I went from utter rejection, severe criticism to absolute acceptance. Does that make sense? Does that not make a logical sense? It really, it really does. And I've seen it. I can't even tell you how many times, thousands, thousands of times in my years where we're in this exact, this exact position in the way I like to relate it. I've done it on previous episodes, but there's a story in that history that I talk about a lot. Implementing a solution, it came in as it wasn't a top-down decision by the company that brought the solution in. It included maintenance personnel, but there were pockets of resistance around the same general concept. So what happened was we isolated a particular team within the organization that was using our software that was the most resistant to it, and we met with them. We had a nice conversation. And what we did, and this was something I wanted to make sure we talked about on today's episode, so this will, this will be a good transition. What we did was we first, we, we knew a lot. We understood what they did. We understood how they did it and all those types of things because we ourselves were individuals that had done much of that work for a number of years prior to even being in software. However, we didn't go at it that way. We went at it about this kind of, Let's hear them out and let's draw out these things about what is meaningful to them. And then we designed, and we did this all very, very quickly, leaning on our own experience. But once we have those things colored in and shaded in, we know that Jim likes this, Joe likes that, Jenny likes this, and Linda likes that, and on and on and on. And we designed a quick, very focused training protocol for those individuals and two weeks later, the person that was in charge of that particular team, you know, maybe they were at a specific group of properties, actually reached out to us and said, I have no idea how I was doing what I've been doing for all these years. And now, not only am I doing that, I can do more of it. I'm getting out of here on time. I don't have to wonder how I'm going to go to my boss and say, hey, I need a part-time addition to my team because the boss, the manager, the CFO, everybody is going to say, good, get it. Wish I could just do that, but it doesn't work that way. Show me why. And now they had all that. And it was like nobody in their previous lives, so to speak, had taken that time. And this is what I'm getting to is how all the vendors out there, some of you do it brilliantly. Some of you don't. There are reasons behind all this. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not trying to shit on anybody. What I'm saying is when you get to a point where you can work with people in this way, meet them where they are, understand these things that you've described, Jim, and then empower them. Exactly. Then you're going to start getting the outcomes, because if those people that are on the front lines, the doers, the wrench turners, I say doers because I learned that from Brian Bieski because he's, yeah. he's, he's Great a big guy. fan of the, the, the doers community, right? He he's, yeah. Hey, we're trying to get stuff done, but let's do it in the best possible way. And he's all about these basic fundamentals. And if you do that really, really well, which I know this is a concept you support, you're, you're, you're going to do really, really well. However, you can't make these assumptions and force these things on people. So I think, 
those approaches that you described, plus for CMMS vendors out there, all of you just, just, just continue to try to do better for them in empowering them and teaching them, but don't force it, learn where they're at and then kind of craft that because it's, it's like all of us, when we got to learn something new, sometimes we're excited, but once we get into that work, we're like, damn, I got to slow down a little bit and this is going to be disruptive. So there's some fear and vulnerability in that. But if you help out what you're supposed to do, he sold these guys software. I'm on a thing about this today. I don't know if you saw my post today on LinkedIn, but I, 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 the thing about like data and companies holding people's data hostage, it's the same with how you support your clientele. Exactly. Just, just, just help them out. I mean, it's, it's, it's elementary, man. Um, so <laughs> What I what I want to what I want to ask because I I think what we're probably going to do, Jim, is some more episodes because I really want to keep exploring these topics. But I want to I want to give you a few minutes for anything that you wanted to talk about today that we would include in this episode, and and then we'll start to wind it down. Absolutely. First of all, big shout for Brian Biaschi, great guy. Uh, he's one of those anomalies at his age that it probably thinks at a higher level than a lot of people do. So great shout out for him. And that was a great podcast you had done with him and the episode. And uh, I just want to make sure that he uh, understands how well he did. That's great. Um, you're right. We have a lot more to talk about. And I think you really hit it on the head talking about, uh, you know, the human side of how we're going to, number one, we're talking about implementation, but we got to talk about right from the company providing me a software package. We have in Let's talk a little bit about the human side of it. We have, in five seconds, we judge every person we come in contact, whether we like it or not. We're giving them, we're giving them the subconscious, hey, are they meeting us or not? Do we like them or we don't? Then we have 90 seconds to build Olympic Synchrony rapport. Somewhere to build that rapport to be able to get uh, our audience to at least engage and willing to listen. Then the rest of it, as you said, we talk about the culture, we talked about that, but I'm talking about the system. If a company, and this is where I think you and I need to have a little bit more of a discussion sometime, talking about the software companies and what they are providing the end user. I want the end user, I want the software company to provide me with every business aspect of why I click a button in the software, how I can short, uh, you know, shortcut a lot of things, uh, come in with some suggestions that actually help me want to use their software. Somebody to come to me and say, I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm gonna come and talk to you. I'm gonna keep touch with you for, for almost, I know I'll talk to you every day or I'll talk to you every week and I'll talk to you every, every two weeks, but I wanna know how well you're doing. If you're doing great, the byproduct is that our company will do great. Big question, a big, a big episode coming up. We need to talk about that. And what does that look like? And what's that, what does that mean to us? Yeah, we're going to do that for sure. I don't want to talk about it anymore because we can, we can, we can put that on a regular schedule forever. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, man, don't even get me started because that's the stuff, baby. Yeah. The elusive win-win exactly. because, and I'll say this, and then we'll start start wrapping it up. It's hard to do. It is, I mean, it's easy to say how to do it, but operationally as a CMMS provider, you got to put a lot of things in place and all these protocols. But man, we're gonna we're gonna get into that because man, the 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 idea behind customers and getting them thriving and you getting this opportunity to then be the successful, you know, best type of company when it comes to how you engage and deliver for your clients. I mean, that's what it's really, really, really all about. So we're in the, you know, the 2020s and we want to bring back some of that 1950s vibe to how we're doing business and taking care of people as if yep. our organizational lives depend on it. So that's enough. I get up on that soapbox, but Jim, how do people get in touch with you if they want to continue a conversation of their own or just kind of keep up with what you're doing? I, I think the best way to get a hold of me would be in LinkedIn for now. I think that is a, that's the easiest means, but I'm willing to help anyone. If somebody wants to have a conversation, most certainly open to it. Uh, as you know, uh, you and I are both champions for, uh, giving people all the tools necessary and, and helping them and discovering and growing ourselves. So that would probably be the best uh, uh, means to get a hold of me. Um, and I, you know, 
I would like to uh, engage with you again in some conversations because I think we still have a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah. We're going to keep that going. I know we already talked about that a little bit for anybody listening to this. You know, Jim's going to be on again. We've got some plans for later this year that I'm working on with CMMS Radio where we're going to we're going to do more to just give everybody some insights on these different things. By the way, uh, just a, a real quick shout out I want to put on this episode before it wraps. There is a community out there that is worth taking a look at. It's free to join it. It doesn't matter what CMMS you use or anything like that. If you're looking for some guidance on maintenance, maintenance and reliability, CMMS and all these best practices, I want you to check out the Maintenance Community Coalition Slack channel. You can sign up. It's free. You can get in there, connect with experts, ask all kinds of crazy questions, and you'll get some crazy answers. So just a quick shout out on that. Jim, you and I are going to do this again. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And anybody out there listening, if you got a question, a topic, you know, hit me up, send me a DM on uh, LinkedIn. However you want to get in touch, you can go to cmmsradio.com, click on what's on your mind, fire off some questions. Nothing's off limits. Just don't use company names. We're not here to hurt anybody. But again, Jim, thanks. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. Like you, got it. you got it. Did you find this episode helpful? Please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit cmmsradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.